Greetings and welcome to a very special episode of the Department of Tangents podcast, the Women in Comedy Festival 2017 edition, with new music from Scott H. Byram. From time to time on the podcast, I like to go to a festival or a large event and do spur-of-the-moment interviews like I did at Comic-Con in Boston last year. This past week, the Women in Comedy Festival was back after taking a year off. It's been one of my favorite festivals for years, and I was sad to see it not happen last year, but the organizers came back this year bigger and better with 89 shows and workshops over five days. They also established a year-round presence with a podcast network featuring How to Be Less Awkward with Laura Murley, Conversations with Funny Feminists with Pam Victor, and Person About Town with Kenise Mobley. And they've also established WICFDaily.com, a news and humor site. I got to as many shows as I could from Wednesday to Sunday and interviewed people I'd never seen before like the Femity Trio and Caitlin Gill, people I've known from the Boston scene like Erin Judge, whom I interviewed along with her fellow Cake Tour comic Caitlin Bailey, and the Department of Tangents' first repeat guest, Reformed Whores. Look out for two more full episodes of the podcast in the next month featuring WICF-related interviews from stand-up and improviser Petey Gibson and the festival's Excellence in Comedy Award winner for this year, Rita Rudner. To start out, we skip ahead to late Friday night, just after a festival party at Laugh Boston, when I spoke with WICF organizers Michelle Barbera and Elise Schurman about the mission of the festival and some of the new additions. After the interviews, hear a ripping new track from Scott H. Byram's The Bad Testament. Enjoy! For, for those who have not heard of the festival, what is the premise of the festival? What is the mission statement? Well, we take the ratio, male to female ratio, of the typical comedy festival and we just flip it. So where you'd see seven or eight men on a lineup and maybe one or two women or no women. Uh, here we have seven or eight women and maybe one or two men or no men um, on, on the lineup. And we're, but we're open to all genders and all, all allies of women are welcome and we get applications from, from all genders. So... But but yeah, we're so our ultimate goal is to just help people make stuff and help and, and on all platforms and get seen and um, network and uh, help close the gender gap in mm. comedy. And also, it's improv, it's musical comedy, it's stand up, it's storytelling, sketch storytelling, and film, short film, and film. Mm. That and that was Elise's brainchild. Mm. That's right. And that's expanded greatly this year. Um, I wouldn't say greatly, but it's definitely expanded. We it's have, twice as big. It's twice as big. <laughs> I guess it's, it sounds really big. Um, uh, this year we had a uh, traditional um, uh, film, short film contest, but then in addition we added a uh, contest we did in conjunction with Rachel Bloom, who mm. is the uh, star and co-creator of Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. And um, she provided a line of dialogue. Uh, you Can't Do That was a line of dialogue. And uh, we challenged filmmakers to create an entire one to five minute piece based on that uh, first line of dialogue. Have you seen any of them yet? Or oh, you many. All them? Okay. <laughs> Over and over. Uh, They're fantastic, really. Such creative and really fun ways to use the line of dialogue uh, and strong female protagonists. We, I'm just really proud of the stuff that came through. And the winner of that gets a mentoring phone call. That's right. It was a cash prize and a mentoring phone call with Rachel. Well, will people get to see this uh, this film after the festival somewhere? Is it going to I'm be? I'm sure. We're trying to. We have to figure that out. We want to make sure the filmmaker feels protected and they can use it. The whole idea is that they can use the film in the future to um, hopefully build up their resume, etc. Um, mm. So we'll work with them to figure out how we can showcase it, and hopefully they'll submit it to more film festivals. Mm. And the, the festival is significantly larger. Oh, they're giving us mood lighting. We're sitting in the lobby of the Weston <laughs> Hotel, by the way. Uh, it got very romantic all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's, it's a different kind of podcast now. <laughs> I have to switch the theme. You've also expanded year-round and, and sort of pushed out to projects that might have more of a national reach as well. Yeah, yeah. I'm just like, why not, like... I've, I, was, I was a really early podcast adopter. I always loved podcasts, so years and years ago. We actually started doing one in 2010, but it was too much work at the time. I didn't have the bandwidth because I was working full-time uh -huh. for the editing. That's what you know. The editing's hard. 
Um, I've learned it again. But, <laughs> but we finally uh, uh, launched our podcast network uh, this spring. And we have, we have Kenise Mobley, who does Person About Town. She just moved to New York. She's a great comedian. She, she, her, she had an existing podcast, which basically takes people and, and they go to their, the, that person's favorite place in town. And then they, like, they talk about it, but then they also talk about like comedy or whatever that person's into. And it's really fun. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we also have some original podcasts. So Pam Victor had just started Conversations with Funny Feminists. And now she's under our umbrella. And she's going to be interviewing Liz Winstead. Of creator of the Daily Show tomorrow at the Brattle for the podcast, and then on Sunday she's going to be interviewing Rachel Dratch of mm-hmm. SNL for the podcast at the Brattle, and that show's like almost sold out. Um, and then there's Yes Homo uh, from Dylan Usher, who's uh, one of the comedians here, and he actually is he recorded a bunch of interviews with the people at the festival, and he did a live podcast taping at the festival, and he's going to edit that all together and launch his first season. Um, yes Homo is an answer to this sort of thing where people would uh online it was kind of a meme where people would be like no homo no homo like just yeah. this if if you were doing something that might seem gay they would say no homo but like he's like yes homo so it's like this very positive light fun um podcast with comedy and interviews and content that's just like really positive and happy and and uh you know yes homo <laughs> and you were doing the walking dead yeah, we've been doing a lot. Wa- yeah, we've been doing The Walking Dead. Uh, uh, Christine and I, again, because we expanded, we just didn't have time to finish the season, but we're going to get right. back to it. But we did, like, a couple of solid seasons on that, and then uh-huh. we basically would watch The Walking Dead, and then we would recap it and do these improvised sketches with sound effects. It was fun. And we're going to get back to it for sure. But then, yeah, and then there's Laura Murley, who's doing How to Be, How to be Less Awkward, and she interviews comedians about awkward experiences. And so, I th- is that it? Yeah, and then there's one more, The Art of the Day Job, which is going to be about, um, you know, people who have day jobs but are also creative mm-hmm. and just how they balance that. So, yeah, lots of cool stuff happening. And more. We're going to be adding more and more. So it's very important. When are the other ones that you mentioned going to start up? There are some that, that you mentioned that haven't launched yet. Yeah, so Yes Homo is going to be launching in a couple of months, I think maybe like this summer. Uh-huh. Because he's right now, he's just um, getting all the content together. Mm-hmm. Uh, and... I love it because all these people who are came to me with these ideas, they didn't. They were so proactive. So it's like I'm just so happy that all these people had these great ideas, and all it took was a little bit of a feeling of a community and a, some support to make it flourish. And mm. I, they, I haven't been doing much. We've got this great podcast editor, and he's kind of taken over the just overseeing it. His name's Alicia Siegel. Mm. And you've got the the WICF Daily as well. Yeah. <laughs> And we've had, you know, we've had people writing on that, and I'm hoping to ramp that up more after the festival. So that's why I'm hoping to focus to, like, have some amount of time to focus on these year-long projects, including our live shows that we do throughout the year. Mm-hmm. And where should people look for all of this this stuff going forward? <laughs> on WICF.com. So Women in Comedy Festival, WICF.com. Mm-hmm. It's all there. Well, thanks, everybody, for taking the time. I know everybody's tired. It's about no, it's two really in the morning fun. right now. I saw the Femity Trio at one of the opening night shows of the festival, and I was impressed with their comedy and their musicality. They sang about taking back certain words that have been used against women socially and politically in one of their more pointed tunes, but they can also do silly songs like one about faking a pregnancy to get a vacation and some sweet alone time. And they did it all with beautiful bluegrass harmonies. Here they are outside of the Rockwell Theater on night one. Femity trio. Femity trio. As feminism. In, feminism. Com- and comedy. comedy. And trio. Femity trio. Femity trio. Yeah. Okay. I, I think I lost it. I saw you for the first time today up at the the Somerville Theater. Awesome. The first show uh, of the Women in Comedy Festival. Yeah. Yes. And would you like to introduce yourself individually so people can place sure, your right? voice with your uh, name? I'm sure. Stacy Hardkey. Mm-hmm. I'm Gabby Van Horn. And I'm Dahlia Glick. And you do music and comedy, and it's it seems like the, the you put equal effort into both, oh, which is you. not yeah, <laughs> necessarily something that 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 people do. Sometimes it's you know people do three chords and oh, we do that don't too. sing. Oh, we, don't. <laughs> yes. we do truly. We 
you bullshit very well. <laughs> but I think, but I, it is also like a genuine bullshitting. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but at the, like we're all we're talented musicians. Yeah. We've been doing it for a long time, and we also love to try and make people laugh. So yeah. it mm-hmm. seemed like a perfect marriage of the two. Mm-hmm. The music part is what comes easiest to us right. because we mm-hmm. all have a background in that, and the mm-hmm. comedy is really what we focus on in terms of. Uh, playing to the top of our intelligence, yeah, and mm-hmm. just coming up with lyrics that build in a, log- a logical way and and yeah. crescendo. That's what we focus yeah. on, and like on specific topics that we feel should be. Oh talked yes, about. and we have. I mean, we tonight was kind of the most like outright laughs we've ever gotten. But a lot of our shows, people don't laugh because they're listening to what we're saying, and we always try to have a message kind of first and foremost mm-hmm. before we try to do the jokes of it. Right. Which is, we do have some stupid songs that are jokey, <laughs> like our pregnancy song you know or faking faking a pregnancy to get um, a yes. vacation basically <laughs> but uh but you know like that is kind of our mission is to like spread a message at the end of the day because we want to feel like like comedy is always always like speaking to the truth of what's mm-hmm. happening today and yeah exactly mm-hmm. some matter so well the yeah. final song of your set tonight was much more pointed than than comical it gets an interesting reaction. Yeah, I mean, do, we, uh, <laughs> Dahlia's mom came to L.A. where we're based, and uh, we played that, like, a, a personal little concert in my uh, dining mm-hmm. room for her, and she started crying after hearing that song. Yeah. And it's just filled with profanity. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and to he- see, like, a, a, a grown woman crying after right. watching, yeah. say, hearing that song. It's like, really? Yeah, what for the audience? What was the name of the song? Um, Ooh. we refer to it as a bitch cunt song. Yes, uh-huh. yes. <laughs> it's, and it's reclaiming all the words that women are called that are that are coined as derogatory, where we're trying to you know reclaim yeah. them. Reclaim those <laughs> and words. If our president is willing, is he, if he's comfortable using those words, then so are we. Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> not that that validates it, but or just anybody, that that's yeah. you know we're, we're, why why be weird about it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so we're. From, yeah. Using those words in helpful and like beautiful ways. And for my can. mom, it was like she was born in '56, so she's kind of a baby boomer, and she was just like, oh, "That was so powerful because it's true. We could never stand up. Like your your generation, like you can stand up, and we could never stand up for ourselves, <laughs> uh-huh. yeah. no matter how hard we tried. We just wouldn't work. And so, as women rise up together, it's taking a while, but it is cool mm. to see the growth and. I always get emotional singing that song, even though it's yes, like funny, tonight, but like especially I almost oh cried on gosh. stage. Me too. Yeah, I think yeah. all three of us did at the same moment. Yeah. Well, because there were applause breaks just after the chorus. They just yeah. they're just shocked I, to I, hear that was... we're comfortable singing those words. Yeah, yeah. 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 So I'm like, I can't cry right now. I know. <laughs> well, well, the line that the, the the line of the song is. is uh, I'm proud of my country. I, I can't, I'd like to be proud of my country. Yeah, Stacey <laughs> Hart, that, that lyrics. Yeah. Uh, she came up with that lyric, like, and so incredibly quickly. And we were like, that's an incredible lyric. And nobody's reacted to it yet besides tonight. And we're like, why not? And we finally got the reaction we're, like, looking for. Yeah. <laughs> this is so rewarding. Yeah. But do yeah. you like to mix the, the sillier stuff with the more serious Absolutely. stuff? Absolutely. Yeah. It's the old spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, our first song that we do usually is about wanting to kill a person who doesn't love us back. And right. <laughs> we like to show an evolution in our set. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and some of them are truly silly. Yeah. And we try to vary our styles, too. You know, like, we do have um, folk ballads, and we have some R&B in there, and we have some country, and we have some uh, angsty 90s rock. So <laughs> we have folk instruments, but it's a lot of different stuff. Yeah. So if you would play a 40 to 50-minute to set... Ooh, yeah. How would the how would the mix go down between? I mean, <laughs> I try to hit every genre. Yeah, yeah. ideally, you're going to get every genre that music. we can that we can yeah. you know be yeah. comfortable playing. We usually build the set so that it's like you know ballad upbeat song, ballad upbeat song, and always ending mm. on an upbeat song. Mm-hmm. But it's good to vary them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, we kind of uh, we uh, have reverence for the bluegrass nature mm. of our instruments, and that kind of is reflected in our our costumes and. Uh, yeah, our, our image and our yeah. voices match that most easily mm-hmm. when yeah. we're singing together. in terms of our harmonies yeah. and that yeah. style. Did you come together over music first? Is that that's where? such no. a good question? <laughs> we came no. together comedy. Yeah, comedy, comedy brought us first. together. Yeah. Uh-huh. We all studied at UCB and we met through that school in different yeah. mm-hmm. capacities. Yeah. Yes, mm-hmm. a nice little triage. Like uh, Dolly and I met in at the Magnum many years, years ago. Yeah. Then yeah. Stacy and I met, and then, then Dolly and I met. And and then she, we realized we knew Gabby, and so then we started working yeah. together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was great. And the, the the bluegrass you can hear in the harmonies as well. The harmonies right. are, mm-hmm. are beautiful, and it's yeah. strange to, to hear <laughs> that 
that the, that was secondary. Oh, absolutely. To, <laughs> right. to just be to to yeah. meeting each other through comedy. Well, I think it was true. something we had in common. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, aside from being feminists and young ladies mm-hmm. in comedy, and so it was kind of the uh, the the thing that we we all shared, and so we were like, maybe we could make we could focus on this aspect. I think at mm-hmm. one point I remember I'm having a flashback of us singing Adele in my car oh, yes. in LA. Do you remember this at all? Do you I, it this? was like pretty recently. Well, I, I, like even before, like when oh. we first started hanging out, I think there was a moment when we were all s- hanging out together and we started singing and like naturally went to our, 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 our parts. parts. Like uh-huh. I was probably middle, you were low and you were high. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So and you don't spend a ton of time oh, working no. out oh yeah no. it's pretty sad truly that sometimes it <laughs> takes us 20 minutes to write a song it might not be a good song but we can do it <laughs> well, I, I was i was saying the other day uh oh, the band is one of my favorite bands oh, yeah. and i can't remember whether whether it was uh whether it was rick danko or levon helm they mm. were somebody was interviewing about the harmonies and they and their uh, how they worked them out how how that happened they said well that's just all of us trying to sing the highest note that we can all <laughs> sing there was the, like, right. like, like there wasn't there's it, yeah. we weren't working on that so much that's yeah. just all of us trying to impress each other wow. singing as high as we See, can I don't think we feel I think yeah, all of us want to be comfortable yeah. so yeah. we just want to show up and we want to make the ideas shine uh-huh. more so yes. than our voices although we'd love to pepper it with you know beautiful sounds and we yeah. do balance out you know what we sing in each song it's all very balanced and there's just like there's nothing like a three part harmony yeah it, there's just so something about good. it that's like so magical like it's like bread and be, butter the, you mm-hmm. could be singing in one note and for salt. a little while yeah <laughs> bread and, butter and salt that's like a new oh, like, like amazing yeah. yeah well how do you place a comic yeah, idea tagged you guys with yes. we will be we're going to do that yeah for sure. <laughs> how, how do you how do you place a comic idea with uh a sound musically like you've got an idea I'm, I'm outside your house and I'm going to burn it down because you don't love me what I, kind of song should that we, be when we were first talking about the idea we'll be like maybe it could go something like this like um, I, I have this new next door neighbor and she's like this or whatever yeah. <laughs> so then we'll just kind of jam on that idea and then we'll find yeah. the chords that match it's, the tone yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. An idea the idea and, tone and sometimes we also want to write a specific song yeah. like yeah. when we um when we, when we did like, uh, which which song am I thinking of? Like Bitch Can Song was more we boobs? wanted. Oh yeah, like for oh, yeah. boobs, we have a newer song that we're working on. Straight <laughs> <It's laughs> to the point. Bitch Can Song. It's a, it's about going braless basically. It's called right. oh it's called braless, braless and, and flawless. flawless. That's yeah. what we call it uh-huh. boobs for short. Yeah. And like for that song, we were looking for an R and B song because we haven't mm. really had one in our mm-hmm. repertoire. At bar this yet. point, it's kind of what we don't have yet. In the mm-hmm. beginning, we could kind of do more of whatever we felt like the tone was. At this point, it's like, okay, what do we not have in our repertoire? Because right. we want to have like different styles. And and as much as it is, it's like so great to see, I don't know, Coldplay play all their songs, but like it's all kind of sounds similar. Right. So we want to make sure we're, especially like with comedy, uh. it's so fun to take such like a dirty idea and make it into such a sweet song. Yeah. Right. Uh-huh. It, helps, it helps the comedy. Yeah. 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 I thought there's, there's some interesting juxtapositions musically. Some of my favorite writers, Warren Zevon, mm, had yeah. a song called Excitable Boy. <laughs> Which has some terrible, awful lyrics to it. Just um, that it's a very poppy sort of song. Yeah. So much so that I actually heard somebody. I was in a mall once and heard somebody made Muzak out of it. Oh, these are the most. No. These are some of the most terrible. It's about an insane person who kills his girlfriend and cool. but it's goes happy. to a home and and. Yeah. But it's it's excitable yeah. boy. They all say. <laughs> right. That's how I feel about Allentown by Billy Joel. It's about the industrial demise. <laughs> right. And, like, right. and we're living here in Allentown. And I was like, oh, yeah. Allentown. I'm like, have you listened to the lyrics? Right. Right. It's so sad. Or like all the other kids with their pumped up tits yes, that are run by run s- faster than my gun. That's yeah. about a school shooting, but it's a beautiful poppy song. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And people dance to it. That's right. They don't listen. It's like a slip of their pumped up kicks. That's our strategy. Just. Uh-huh. Infiltrate. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, tonight it was it was three songs, right? Is that four. Four, four songs together, tonight. Yeah. Our fourth it, one we cut a little bit, but yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But it, it was a very Americana sound yeah. tonight. Yeah. To me, it reminded me maybe just maybe I'm just reacting to the banjo, no, but it reminded right. me a lot of the <laughs> Avid Brothers. Uh, oh, thank you. Oh, in, in terms of of sort of style and that's and, actually great. We never get that. We usually get a. We got Haim tonight, which mm-hmm. I was like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> we've never got that before. Yeah. Haim, we've Well, that's three women with instruments, right? Yes. Right. So, <laughs> right. 
Yeah. 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 Um, so a longer set, you would hear m- all the different, different styles. styles. Yeah, different styles. But that is mm-hmm. our classic sound because of the nature of the instruments that we play. I mm-hmm. mean, Gabby and, and Stacey like, also play piano. I also play guitar and ukulele, whatever. Mm-hmm. But that's what we originate as is that. Mm-hmm. And, and we, we want to be true to that. Yeah. yeah. And mm-hmm. like for the Baby Mama song that we call it, uh, we try and cut back from the other instruments because we do want to have that have a different sound mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. like an acapella um, more of an acapella more mm-hmm. of like a like that smooth like smooth, sexy sultry sexy yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you know what it's about is not sexy at all <laughs> <laughs> so you're based in LA yes yeah do you tour at all not yet we this tour around LA we do LA uh-huh. yeah. we would love to I mean we'd love to do college tours and whoever will have us We're yeah like, we're pretty new, and we're so, headed to yeah. New York after this. We have a show at the Pit, mm-hmm. seven thirty on Sunday. But other than that, we have mostly focus on LA. Yeah. How long have you been together? About a year and a few months. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Do you play music separately as well? Is it something that's? I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I don't know. Like, Dahlia I does guys, for the. For I the I person. do, but it's not like it's it's a hobby. It's truly a hobby. Like comedy is my first mm-hmm. love, and especially with these ladies, mm-hmm. I do play alone. But it's more of like. Here's a song for my mom. <laughs> <laughs> and we're all actors and improvisers, so we have our own uh, tracks. But yes. we, this is our one of our favorite things project. to do. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. work together. Do you, are there any other projects you want to mention that you're involved in? We have a show once a month mm-hmm. at UCB. Yes, uh, it's in called LA. Funny Tunes, where we um, invite other comedic musicians, and we found so many incredible musicians. It's crazy yeah. how many, like musically talented, vocally talented, and like comedically talented yeah. these musicians are it's been like a huge eye opener and I'd love to it's an open mic that, yeah. for comedy musicians mm-hmm. yeah. yeah a lot of people do it but it's like they're coming out of the woodworks it's not that yeah, popular no in LA yet. yeah mm. yeah and where can people find out more about your FemityTrio.com. Yeah, and also com. Facebook, Instagram. It's all at FemityTrio, F-E-M-M-E-D-Y-T-R-I-O. And have you recorded yet? Do you have an no, album? No, or... that's our project for the summer. Well, we do have our music video. We have our music video. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's not outdated, but it, it so. did get... Uh, yeah, like 75,000 <laughs> views on Facebook. Yeah, something like that. Something like that. It was yeah. called Hillary for Humanity. It was mm-hmm. before mm-hmm. the de- the Democratic Convention. Yeah. Right. It was basically like a... It was like, what are we going to do if Trump wins? Yeah. <laughs> and oh, find out. <laughs> yeah. like now a we can't survival play guide sort of right, thing. Right, no. right. Yeah. Now we can't play that song anymore. Yeah. But, uh, it's retired. Yeah. Uh-huh. With the we, show that we run, we play a new song every time as a group. So our goal was to have like, you know, six new songs at the end of the six months and then have an EP start to be produced at the end of the summer. So we're... Working on that. <laughs> mm-hmm. So you're thinking by the end of the year or something, people should start looking for that. Oh, yeah. yeah, hopefully yeah. by the fall. Mm-hmm. Oh, say. hopefully, yeah. We're gonna hopefully at least record this summer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for taking thank the you. time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I also caught up with Caitlin Gill after having seen her at a late show on Wednesday night. Her comedy was very political but not standoffish and very personable. She told a great story about going to Las Vegas and wanting to hate it and finding herself sucked in, even collaborating with a guy in a Make America Great Again hat in a casino. She co-hosts the Crab Apples show in Los Angeles with Bobcat Goldthwait and hosted a version of that at the festival. We are trying to make crab apples into a podcast, uh, and it's coming out soon, and I'm very excited about it. But it's an interesting skill to learn. Mm-hmm. There is a learning curve. And it, it's it, will it be a stand-up podcast? Or we what have some it... stand-up from our live show and interviewing comedians and friends. We do it out of our house. Uh, Bobcat and I are roommates that live in the basement. Follow your dreams, and you too can live in the basement uh-huh. of a police academy star. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> it's been really a treat. Uh, there's really fun conversations with people we love. Typical podcast fodder, except it's two friends from different generations of comedy inviting in their friends and into their living room. Hmm. So, and you're Caitlin Gill. I am Caitlin Gill. Yes, yes, indeed. I'm That's Caitlin Gill, a comedian out of Los Angeles, and one half of Crab Apples, which is a little show we do at the Hollywood Improv every Tuesday at eight. Next time you're in LA. Yes, yeah, so and you did a a version of that tonight. We at the, did. At brought the it to Rockwell. the Women in Comedy Festival. I was so proud that they had us. Uh, it, was, it was a real treat. Uh, it was not Bobcat, it was just me, which is also kind of fun to do at a ladies' comedy festival. Uh, mm-hmm. The lineup was just smashing. The crowd was darling. It was a splendid night. Mm-hmm. And how did you and, and Bobcat 
me? How I, I just in the comedy scene in Los Angeles? Actually, in San Francisco. That's where I started. I was in San Francisco for a bunch of years doing comedy. There's a festival there called SF Sketch Fest, and this was six ish years ago now. Uh, I don't even remember, but Bobcat and I were scheduled to do the same show, and I walked into the venue, which is the now renovated Purple Onion. Uh, it was the Purple Onion, which is now oh. known as Doc's Lab, but oh, Purple it- Onion to comedy nerds is, is a historic landmark, so it was a real treat to do a show there, but I walked in, and there wasn't really a green room. There was just kind of a corner where comics were sitting, and somehow Bob was the only one there, and his daughter, Tasha, who's miraculously wonderful... Uh, it's not a miracle. Bobcat tried really hard, but uh, it's right. still a miracle. Uh, she's splendid, but they were sitting together, and Tasha was just making fun of her dad, and I sat down and started making fun of her dad, and I have not stopped making fun of Bobcat Goldthwait for years and years, uh. and it's formed a bond that I never would have predicted, yes. but I treasure dearly. He's yeah. the best. You showed a, a nice video today before the I show of, of him in his... his Peak Police Academy yeah. years. I am a I'm a terrible friend in that I never shy away from reminding him that he was in Hot to Trot. Um, no, I made Bobcat a little Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous since Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous never made a Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous about Bobcat, so I stepped up and uh-huh. filled that hole. Uh, mm-hmm. Which is to say, I stole a bunch of clips from YouTube and then edited them together on free software. It's the equivalent of like a Fisher Price toy for video editing. Uh-huh. But it came together nicely. I was happy with it. Uh, you guys do a lot of shows together? You Yeah, we host a, we toured together for a little while where I would feature for Bob when he would go out on the road. And when we came home, it's nice to have a show in L.A. that you look forward to every week. So we started just over a year ago doing Crab Apples, uh, as stated, at the Hollywood Improv Lab, which has been a great home for us. Uh, and it's been wonderful. We host it together. We just kind of talk up front, and we invite our friends to come up and do... Some good stuff, music and comedy and wonderful times. Mm-hmm. Do you find your, your stand-up uh, dovetails well? It does. We're both uh, telling stories. We both tell you a little bit about ourselves and our life, but we have a different tone and a different perspective. Uh, mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm 36 and he's 50, question mark. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's just different worlds coming together in a really neat way. We, we do jive neatly. We have a, a similar tone if... Uh, yeah, which surprised me too, but it gels really nice. Mm-hmm. Now you, you talked tonight about uh, uh, being a lesbian in Trump's America. Yeah, uh-huh. And I hear how, how people are more afraid now to visit a red state. You mentioned that. Yeah, I did have fear. Is that, is that uh, has any of that borne out? Have you seen, you has know, that fear been justified, do you think, yes, in your no, travels? Yes, no, but more no than yes. Mm-hmm. It is a reality that there's some uh, some uh, some shitty stuff that was repressed is now bubbling up in a way uh-huh. where it hasn't in many years, and not in my lifetime, and certainly not since I've been out. It's uh, I don't even know what that means. Since I figured out that also girls are fun, uh, uh-huh. it hasn't been such a dark time where people are kind of willing to barf up whatever issues they have about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, it happens now, but I've gone to a couple red states since, and have been so warmly received that I just have to remind myself that most people are good and that's true most of the time. Uh, Mm -hmm. Still hard to believe sometimes. Mm -hmm. I still let fear overwhelm me sometimes, but fear is bullshit and never means anything and it's not real. So I just try to forget about it. Right. It's the, uh, the difficulty is in overstating, overstating it or understating it. How do you get, how do you describe exactly what's happening without letting fear get to you or getting too blase Sure. About it. Man, that's a good question. And I think I'm still figuring all that out. I try to be honest with audiences, period, but I'm going to let them know if I was nervous to come there. And I think letting that steam out helps the audience because some mm-hmm. people are afraid for me. And if I acknowledge that, yeah, me too, it it releases their tension a little bit. Um, yeah, I don't know. I've My fears have not been borne out. Sure, mm-hmm. people are shitty and there's more bigotry and, and, and shitty stuff on the surface than there was a few a, a year ago now but I, you know I went to Idaho and Idaho was very kind and uh-huh. I expect the same to be true about Alabama and I expect the same to be true about Texas where I'm headed tomorrow morning it's, uh, I just try to count on the inherent goodness of people and I told a silly joke about Las Vegas and gambling with a man in a MAGA hat and that's uh-huh. true and that guy was real nice and uh, I don't agree with him, but I honestly do wish the best for him. That's why we disagree politically is because we both think we have the right idea for what mm-hmm. might make things better. 
So I try to remember that, that even people that are on the opposite end of the spectrum, even people that I think their views are abhorrent, mm -hmm. they usually hold them because they think that's what's best for people. Mm -hmm. That's a good motivation. It's a terrible reality, but it's a right. good motivation. I find that there are many people out there who have ideas about what's best for everybody else, uh, for, for people sort mm -hmm. of writ large, that doesn't necessarily translate into how they talk to you person to person. That's true. Uh, it is true. Luckily, uh, having a spotlight and a microphone puts you at a power advantage that people generally respect, which is odd, but I do it too. When I meet somebody more famous, I'm very polite and I cower. Uh -huh. and I'm not saying I'm more famous than a normal person, but usually if you just were on stage for an hour, people have this level of respect that I wouldn't get if I just met them at a bar. Mm -hmm. um, I try not. I try to remember that. that uh -huh. <laughs> maybe I should be careful about what bars I go to. But... Uh -huh. Uh, people are generally pretty okay. Mm. That's all I can do to keep going, is just remember that the last show was good, the next one will probably be good too, because mm. it's terrifying. It's real weird. <laughs> so where can find, people find out more? About me? About me, about uh, uh, whatever. CaitlinGillComedy.com is my silly website, and I'm on all the social medias, Caitlin Gill on the Facebooks and at RobotCaitlin on Twitter. Uh, yeah, I have some... Fun, exciting stuff coming up, but I hope that stays true and that statement is evergreen. So, mm -hmm. whenever people are hearing this, I have some exciting stuff coming up. <laughs> right, and, and look for crab apples sometime yeah, crab in the future. Apples. We're touring around with it a little bit uh, starting this year, which is very exciting. I have working with Bobcat, he, he's the coolest dude I know. He's a really wonderful human being who's driven by a need to tell stories, and he's a comedian to the bone just a wonderful person I've learned a ton from and we've toured all over together we've gone to crazy places we've gone to great places and terrible places uh, and I'm really proud that over the last couple of years we've built this thing that we can travel to together um, where we know our audience is coming it's just building into something really good mm. where uh, it's not just that guy from Police Academy but it's this guy doing a whole bunch of new stuff Bob has a TV series coming out later this year on True TV he's directing a project for Bridget Everett on Amazon I know this is a Bobcat commercial right now but I'm really <laughs> happy that uh, people he's worked with for lots of years are still want to work with him mm -hmm. and a generation of comics like me that he inspired also really really want him involved in their projects it's so mm -hmm. exciting I'm, um, I'm fine with the Bobcat commercial yeah I, right <laughs> I, I saw Share the Warmth in high school it was a great so great it's a benchmark for me for, yeah I was a, I was sort of a, a farm kid and that was not a thing that I would see right? except on video we didn't have we didn't have cable we didn't have a house close enough to another house to stretch <laughs> to the cable, cable. <laughs> from so the video store and the, this uh, so this, did you find we, all the comedy you love here in Boston I found a bunch of it. I got to see it's a, a great town for it. A lot of people. The one of my first, uh, one of the first shows I came to, to see here uh, was a, a Dingho reunion show. Yeah. Uh, and I got to see this. Stephen Wright was on that, oh, that show, and, and Bobcat was on that show, and I was introduced to Tony V on that yeah. show, and and Barry Crimmins and, and Lenny Clark, uh, and uh, Mike McDonald. There, it was a three-hour marathon yeah. show and Don Gavin was on that show There's so many people that I I'm not mentioning <laughs> that, that I should that I should mention but I, that this would be just mentioning the names that were on that show yeah or would, it's an all-star list this, would, would what take started an hour. here is still just crazy great and he, yeah I think you made a lot of comedy fans out of the city nationwide farm he, kids everywhere we're real eager to get those VHS tapes yes <laughs> But that was that was how I first saw this scene, and I was sort of like, all of, all of these people are here. Yeah, very concentrated for kind of a while. I started in San Francisco, which is another city that has quite a comedy history to mm -hmm. boast about, and it's I'm sure Boston com comics have felt something similar to what I felt in San Francisco, where mm -hmm. you you feel how big the shoes are that you're trying to fill, and it really pushes you to do better and make yourself stronger, make yourself a better mm -hmm. comic, because mm -hmm. you know how good the people that came out of San Francisco are mm -hmm. uh, and they include I mean Bobcat spent time there Robin spent time there there are a lot of people that sort of bubbled up out of the San Francisco scene that mm -hmm. changed comedy a little bit Boston did that ten times over any mm -hmm. city ever Chicago and Boston are the two that are rivaling for most influential comedy <laughs> scenes in history maybe well, cause, yeah because they've got the, the second city yeah and yeah and just a really lively and... scene 
You, did you spend time in the Portland scene, or did you? Or were you just? We talked Portland about that earlier. At least once a year. It's one of my favorite towns to do comedy in. Portland. Lo- I'm hoping it's similar to Boston because this is only my second trip out here. I confession: the first time I came to Boston to perform was in a National Poetry Slam. I'll leave now. I'll see myself out. I apologize. <laughs> I'll just go. You'll hear the sound of a door open. Well, there's this podcast is called the Department of Tangents, so oh, anywhere good. you want to jump to is fine. Yeah, I came here uh, when it was hosted in Boston and Cambridge a few years ago for the National Poetry Slam, and that's the oh, only so the time Lizard I Lounge. Here. Yeah, yeah, uh huh. That's a great scene. Yes, and uh, I mean Boston Slam poetry scene is untouchable as well. There's performance arts just leaking out of the city. Well, I, I live north of here in a small oh, yeah? town called or a small city really called Lynn. And, and there are a couple places around there that do uh, that do op- music open mics, I'm, yeah. and I'm part of that scene. That's and awesome. it, it's amazing just how much talent there is in that concentrated yes. area north of here, mm-hmm. uh, in, in the Lynn, Salem, Revere, North Shore area. It can be amazing to see how much talent is just in that little part that's not even the part of greater Boston necessarily. It's sort of north of here. So Yeah. There's, there's so much talent in so many little... So many little places. And I, I believe this because I found it to be true for myself, and I bet it's true for a lot of other people. The greatest artists that you're going to love the most, you don't know their name yet. You didn't right. see it on a billboard, and it's not on a poster. You're going to go to a show like that, and somebody's going to blow you away, and you're never going to find them any other way. Uh, we're talking about Portland. Portland knows that. Their city really kind of circles around comedy and loves that there are lots of comedy shows there. You mm-hmm. can go to Portland, and I bet this is true here, where you can have two 8 o'clock shows, two 10 o'clock shows, where you're running around town, like grabbing mm-hmm. up spots everywhere you can. That's four shows on a Wednesday night, maybe, and they're mm-hmm. all full. That's so great. Those are people who know that they, they don't worry about who's on the bill. They're not looking at the lineup. They just trust it's going to be good. And mm-hmm. I think that's true most places. Even if you see a bad comedy show, just trust me. Go to another one. You'll find somebody that you love. Right. I think that's true for music too. Yeah, well, I, I was uh, I interviewed uh, Kelly McFarland for the yeah. Boston Globe for the she's she's fantastic. She's I hope so I fantastic, I, such a killer. There's just no crowd she can't crack. She's so charming, right. so funny. And we we talked about uh, some of some of the shows she's played where people have never seen a comedy show before, yeah. and it seems amazing that they haven't. But you <laughs> but you maybe you have that one impression to make. Yes. To make them a comedy fan. I understand why people are nervous about live comedy. I think people, especially compassionate or sensitive people, are very, uh, they're they're not necessarily interested in watching somebody fail, and they're Mm. concerned that somebody's not going to do well. Mm -hmm. Uh, People aren't going to do well. You will see people fail. But comedians, this is something I've learned uh, about comics that I really love, failure is part of it. You will fail again and again and again, and the only measure of you as a comic is if you get back up or not. So yeah, mm-hmm. watch somebody eat trash. They're going to be t- like that'll happen. But they're uh, going to go backstage, they're going to work on it and they're going to do better sometime. Like they're not defeated. Their bubble isn't popped. Uh, this is just part of the game. So if you go to a if you're nervous about going to a comedy show, this is my second PSA in a very short interview. <laughs> right. Just go and if somebody fails, it's totally all right. They're going to be fine. They're not less respected. Bombing's part of it. Right. Everybody and, has skin knees. If you don't have skin knees, you're not doing it. And by the way, if if you're at a comedy show and somebody is failing and you hear two or three people laughing, those are the other comics. Yes. Yeah, that is generous. <laughs> that is somebody from the back. That happens all the time when somebody you know and respect is eating shit on jokes that you know you like. You're just standing in the back like, ha, 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 that is funny. You're all wrong, that's funny. It's a nice community of people to be a part of. We're well, all weird and broken, but I, it's a nice community of people to be a part of. I've seen the other part of that where oh, yeah, the comics the are the back. Oh, yeah, the stone wall of comics where well, suddenly no, well, the, everybody wants a cigarette and they're all gone? Yeah. Well, no, where, where they're laughing, but they're laughing because you're failing. Yeah, I like that laugh too, honestly. That's, Suddenly, I've bummed plenty of times and you are laughing inside. I have been at shows where I am the only non-comedian oh, on the yeah. show and the rest of it's comedian. And that's that's so rough and also so Isn't wonderful. It? It's kind of, yeah, you were truly watching how the sausage gets made and it's a fascinating yes. factory to be inside of. Yes. Well, yeah. well, thank you for, for taking the time to speak. I it appreciate it. It was a pleasure. It. And thank you for doing this and hanging out at the Women Comedy Festival. We yep. appreciate it. You're very welcome. I was also very glad to catch up with Katie and Marie from Reformed Horrors, whom I first spoke with way back in Episode 9 of the podcast in July. We caught up on what they've been doing since, and they had a couple of fun announcements to make about upcoming projects. So, so <laughs> you are the, the first repeat guests 
Oh, oh my goodness. Oh, yeah. The podcast. Oh, oh, look at us. Yes. yes. Oh, we are curtsying. Thank you. <laughs> so we, we spoke, was it May that, that we spoke? Oh, it golly, I don't know. Late spring, summer yeah. of 2016. Yeah, I have no idea what, where we are, what year it is. <laughs> well, it was, you were opening for Dweezil Zappa. Yeah! Oh, man, that was so fun. Uh, it was a good show. Mm-hmm. It was, yeah, it was, it was great. And it was a fun show. tour. They were so nice to us and, like, so cool. And okay. that was neat. And since then, you've played the, the Buffalo Chips. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yep. And how was that experience? It was Wild. That's uh-huh. a, so. If you don't know, the Buffalo Chip is a venue in Sturgis, South Dakota, that is highly populated during the Sturgis Motorcycle Rally. So it's part <laughs> of that, which is the biggest motorcycle rally in like the world or something. I don't know. It's a lot of motorcycles. Uh-huh. Uh, and we opened for Weird Al there and uh-huh. Leonard Skinner yeah. and Cheap Trick. Uh-huh. Randomly, yeah. all on the same bill for. for yeah, that. Like, it was like yeah, the whole so like, yeah. week, but like yeah, it was weird, but it was great. And we did that. Yeah, we did like different bills. But, Eighteen like, shows bills. in eight days. Wow. Yeah, and we lived in an RV in the middle of like because it's kind of like the desert, you know. You're like hanging out and just you know partying up. We didn't really party that much because we filmed our web series during the day and then had three shows every yeah. night. But partied uh, it up as much as we could with and getting our like, shit done. This is a funny <laughs> story though. We were asked to open for um, Kid Rock. But then there was, like, rain or something, or he got delayed. And they were like, well, are you still up for opening for him? We're like, it's too late. We have to go to sleep now. So we went to sleep while, like, Kid Rock uh, played. And so we did not open for Kid Rock, but we could have. Could have, should have, <laughs> would have opened for that man. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> were all the audiences fairly similar? Was it a... Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, a... well, you know, you look out into a sea of, you know, bikers. They're all pretty much the same color. <laughs> and that color would be a white. A light. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah. But a crazy thing that did happen is that um, we were, what, what band was, oh, it was Miranda Lambert. And she was playing, and then all of a sudden the show was over, and it became like a Trump right. rally, an official like Trump rally, um, uh. which was, you know, that's their thing. That's not our thing. But we were like, what the fuck is happening now? <laughs> they like, it was interesting though, because like, I thought it would be more of like a thing, and then the truth is everyone's like, we got it, we're, we're clearing out, moving on to the next thing, so. Uh, so yeah. How, how did it, how well were you received by those audiences? They love really us. Really well, yeah. They love us. And it's fun because like, we do like, feminist songs or whatever, sing about girls shitting and stuff, and they love <laughs> it. They're like, yes, girls do poop too. We're like, we are spreading the gospel yeah. of the horse right now. And it's neat because we're like, sneaking in our agenda to these these yeah, and it's fun. Bikers we and, don't, you know. Yeah, we're not like rough about it. But yeah, it's a good time. I, it's I so looked fun. at the Facebook page and there, there it was just it was just all like metal guy, metal guy, metal yeah. guy. <laughs> and then the 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 first woman who appeared on the the, uh, the Facebook site was half naked on a motorcycle. <laughs> right, like we definitely have accumulated some fan base from there. <laughs> uh-huh. So that's happening, and that's great. We love them. And then, but it's weird too because, like, if you uh, dig further, you see like there's like a lot of like we're getting because we're also going on tour on our own now more because we were mm-hmm. opening for Dweezil Zap the last time we saw you, but now we're sort of like just doing our own headlining type tours too yeah. to mm-hmm. see how that goes. Really exciting. We just got back from one and it went great and like it's nice to see like there's a different crowd that comes out just when we're not at a motorcycle rally uh. or like something like that. And we have like a lot of like young yeah. women, you know. And our big exciting news, I think we should tell them. Sure, let's do it. We're going to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. Oh, I've always wanted to go. Yes, I have, I've us never too. Been. We've, really tried, we've been trying for like three or four years, and it's happening this year, and we're going to go for the entire festival. Hmm. So August 4th through August 27th, we'll be, per- be performing in Scotland for every single night for that whole, whole yeah. run. You should come to Edinburgh this year, and you can see us. We, yeah. I actually, I didn't, I, I actually went to Edinburgh, not to the <gasps> festival, but last, just to oh, Edinburgh just last to year. Tra- oh, oh man. Yeah, my, my wife and I went on a, a train trip of the Highlands. Oh, my oh, gosh. Wow. Uh, That's amazing. For, for, Scott, for, uh, for our anniversary. Oh, it was, so it was cool. It was gorgeous there. Yeah, I really, I mean, we'll be working, we obviously. We won't be able to see as much. But I want to, like, pop like off at least for one day and, like, go hiking and, you know, at least mm-hmm. see some castles yes they have a big one there we we got yeah. to, the, to the mouth of the castle and then it was they said it, it's closing in an hour and a half and you will not have time oh, to no. see it, it kicked you away. but there, there's there there's there's a lot of it's just a beautiful city there's mm-hmm. a, there's you'll see the spire on your way in there are 
Well, here is the order of attraction for me. There was a beautiful spire and architecture and two record stores. Yeah, oh, wow. <laughs> that's, that's, one great. that's so cool. That's a big sort of folky oh, nice. sort of record store. That's and they're so on, cool. like the end of the same street. And apparently there are another couple somewhere in the city. <laughs> so that's that's my own sort of geekery. Like, oh, look at one of the world's most beautiful cities. <laughs> right. And two record and stores. two yes, record stores. I love it. Yeah, it'll be. I I, I want to get out there at some point. Oh, that's to cool. the festival. Yeah, we're so excited, and we're we're rooming with all these comedians, so it's gonna be. Uh, it'll be really. It'll interesting. be fun. <laughs> we'll also try to get some cross promotion going there with the yeah. comedians. Yeah. So yeah, a flat with six comedians. Oh my god. Uh, are you playing uh, on your own headlining tours? Are you playing mostly? Comedy clubs or music venues, a mix of both? It's been mix. such a yeah. mix, yeah. Uh, we, like, we've been doing, well, we have some, like, comedy, comedy clubs that we're, like, headlining soon, but then also in our last tour, we did a lot of, like, more indie shows, too, with mm-hmm. some, like, like more, I don't know, like, not, like, the traditional club clubs. Uh, and that was really cool. Yeah, to see we did this really fun one like in DC where Katie's from, where it was like a burlesque. Um, they did burlesque and had stand ups, and then we closed it out. Mm-hmm. So it was like an all, uh, definitely an alt comedy type feel. Really cool room. And they pack it out. I mean, like, yeah. these get, like, packed. So it was neat really to, fun, yeah. to do, you know, all di- we do anything to everything. Yeah. <laughs> we straddle I, both. <laughs> and you're here at the, the Women in Comedy Festival. Yeah, this yeah. is our first time. We were actually booked a couple years ago, and we. We're so excited. We were so excited to be coming. And then Les Claypool asked for us to open, so we had to actually tell, we had to pull out of the festival uh, so we could go open for Les Claypool. So we felt bad about it, but that was like a two year relationship that then. Yeah, we needed. To <laughs> we had to do the Les Claypool thing. <laughs> right. if, if right. But we're here now, and we're so excited to be here. So If you've got to pull out of the festival for some reason, yeah. Les Claypool asked yeah. you to. Sometimes so. pulling out works great. <laughs> <laughs> What's the and percentage on that again? Yeah, yeah, I'm exactly. not sure. <laughs> I could just see that was it was it CBS that had the, uh, the more the, you know. yeah, <laughs> yes, with, the, <laughs> with the stars yeah, and everything. Totally. Yeah. So I, I was going to say it must be you. You said you retired before we started this, and it must oh yeah, be exhausting. It's nothing like. 18 shows in eight days. Oh, I mean, that's oh, yeah, today? Day. No, we, we just, just missed our like, bus yeah. this morning uh-huh. <laughs> and then just, you know, got on another bus. Nothing, nothing like filming no, a web series. Not. And yeah, mm-hmm. that no, we're different. great. Yeah. <laughs> but you're on four or five shows over, over what is it, three or four days for this, right? We're on, yeah. a, we're on a couple shows for the next couple days. Um, again, it's not like Sturgis. <laughs> but, uh-huh. but it's been fun. And we're like exploring Boston more because we really haven't had a chance to do a lot of shows on our own out here. Mm-hmm. So we're trying to like meet people. And like this venue has been great. We're at Laugh Boston right yes. now. And like this is an awesome venue. Yeah. Oh, it's we'd really cool. come back and like just sort of finding out what the deal is here because we're, you know, we're, we're a country western band, but we are based out of New York. So we're trying to get closer hubs so we don't have to drive so much. <laughs> we can just, well, like, hop on a bus or whatever. Have you seen any other acts that you've enjoyed at the, uh, the festival? At the festival? We just Not, got here. Yeah, we just, so we our bus just seen. pulled in and we came oh, here. Oh, it's just today. Yeah, so we're yeah. hoping to see some things tomorrow. Yeah, but there's a lot of panels tomorrow that we'd like to go to, some industry talks and, and like, so many sketch fun comedy shows things. So yeah. we'll have to check it out and see what's going on. Yeah, it's been one of my favorite festivals here. Oh, really? Oh, good. For, for years. This is sort of their, they... They took a year off uh, and came back okay. with, oh, okay. uh, I think they said, 85 shows. Wow. They're going on it's from Wednesday to Sunday. Wow, that's a lot. Uh, 200, Jesus. 215 acts. Not even 215 people, 215 acts. Yeah. Uh, and five workshops. Wow. Yeah, that's uh, there's good. film, there's improv, there's wow. music. There's, so it's, yeah. you picked a good year yeah. to debut oh, good. at the Women in Comedy Festival. Perfect. That's so cool. Yeah, it's it's neat. It's really fun. And it's fun to like hang out with our comedian friends that we've you know, met in New York, and then they are actually from Boston, like Emma, who was on our show tonight. And, oh, yeah. Um, and also to meet local great. Boston people that like we didn't know. Yeah. We want to like, yeah. work with and meet and like build relationships with which is always a great fun I mean the comedy community is so great that way that you can like you already have this thing that bonds you so yeah yeah let's see so what's next are you recording do you have we're traveling a lot Mm -hmm. um we got a couple gigs but then the big one is we're going back down to Charleston but we're and we're also headlining the um Dead Crow comedy venue in um Wilmington Wilmington, North North Carolina yeah we're doing kind of a cool little tour um 
next month, just in May, it's like we're hitting up uh, Chapel Hill, North mm-hmm. Carolina, at DSI Comedy Theater. And then we're headlining the Dead Crow, and then we're going down to Piccolo Spoleto Festival at Theater 99 in Charleston. So like mm-hmm. a nice little week in North Carolina, South Carolina. And mm-hmm. two days we have off, we're going camping. Camping, <laughs> camping, yeah! camping, camping. There's this the little dump. island off the coast of... Um, Right where Charleston is, I think it's called Ca- uh, Casper Island, oh. and you can only get to it by boat, and you have to get a permit in order to camp there. And mm. some buddies of mine have already got the permits, and I'll, I'll just bring my go. tent in yeah. the merch bag, and we're, I'm going to take Katie camping. Yeah, just with bring some my southern but you're boys. Gonna, you're going to take the, the merch bag. Huh? Yeah, probably. Yeah, so, <laughs> so much merch on that island that you need a boat to get to. That's our um, guys. Our, all of our merch is going to sell smell like um, the sea <laughs> for the next year. It already <laughs> smells like fish, but that's for a different. But that's reason. beside uh, the point. <laughs> So you're going to sell that. I'm assuming you're going camping with friends, so you're going to sell this to all your... Yes, we'll just bring it along. We're, we're constantly just hustling every day. Yeah. And hustling. Do, 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 do. No, <laughs> that's us. And it, is camping the uh, a regular thing? Is no, that, is never. I, I camp a lot. She, she does I haven't gone in a long time. I, I went on this huge camping trip when I was younger through um, in Minnesota, and we, like, mm. would, we canoed from, like, campsite to campsite for, like, a week or something mm-hmm. and that was amazing i would love to do more of that but like i you know i just don't have the time or money so uh, i haven't been doing it that <laughs> sounds like either a, a like a coming of age movie or yeah a, or, 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 a or a meryl street or like a horror movie or, or, or yeah, yeah. Like coming from canoeing from camp to camp oh, i used to yeah. love that movie amazing. river wild running wild river whatever. runs wild yeah i never saw it the, oh, is that the, yeah, like, the kevin bacon movie where he takes the family hostage and yes the, the, yeah the, yeah yeah that and deliverance oh. love them i haven't <laughs> wow I you haven't, haven't seen deliverance no i, I haven't oh. seen uh river wild since oh, river i think wild. uh i think I, I saw it on beta oh, oh I, saw God. I was a, a holdout with beta for a very oh, long wow. time <laughs> let's bring it back <laughs> yeah, well the, the good part of it is that no one will ever get to see me in Godspell oh. and, and Oklahoma because the only copies of, of, of me on <laughs> playing on Old Man Carnes are on beta That's so nobody so will uh, it's very it's technology protected now who are you in Godspell? I, well I was Herb if Herb, that makes a yes. difference to, uh, to anybody the, 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 the strong man yes because, well basically because I was there were no strong men auditioning for Godspell, <laughs> so they got the chubby kid to play the oh, strong man. Oh, my God. So that was, and I, I kept that tie-dye into college. Aww. And, which <laughs> did not make me as cool as I thought it, it was going to. I played her. This is my costume from Godspell. Yeah. Yeah, they, nobody speaks anybody's name in Godspell. Yeah. So don't, don't. That's amazing. All right, so anything else you want to mention? Uh, what else we got? I don't even know. Oh, well, I mean, uh, so it's not out yet, but when, like we oh. said, when we were in Sturgis, we filmed this web series. Mm-hmm. So um, it's called uh, Journey to Greatness. Uh-huh. It's a choose-your-own-adventure web series. Uh-huh. And it should be coming out in the next couple Soon-ish, of months. We're, yeah. we're kind of, we're, we produce the whole thing ourselves, and we've been hiring out and, and have some really great people working on it with us. So we've been, it's like getting real close to being done and then we're going to be shopping around for distribution but if we don't get that then we'll just Put release it, it independently it yeah. but we're so excited because we've we've really wanted to do that for so long to mm-hmm. to film you know because we've been pitching our television show around here and there and stuff but but really it's great for us to like film it and show it to people and this is like our baby yeah. it's definitely like a scrappy a scrappy thing too because we like literally shot like in the afternoons when we weren't filming so it's also just like a fun like um expression of like our experience in oh. at Sturgis. In Sturgis. So, yeah. Yeah, it's like a really random You won't have thing, but any cool. more questions about what Sturgis is like after you see uh, the web series. Or you <laughs> may have like more questions. <laughs> We're not Good sure point. yet. Which, but, yeah. Is it like an improv thing? No, no, no it's fully scripted. 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 Yeah, we wrote it's it a on the road. It's an adventure. So R- like, right. Yeah. That would be a uh... It's hard to improv that. <laughs> yes, improv would be a very What's going to happen now? We don't know. Yeah. But we got like um we ooh, they loud. turned up the music in right. here. All right. Um, we got like friends uh, who we met the year before at Sturgis who uh, were either work the venue or like our other performers, comedians to act in it as well. So uh, it's, it's we're fun. so excited. It's a good time. Yeah. 
So look for that on uh, uh, yeah, 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 the next couple. Yeah. Yep. For and if you haven't seen it yet, we have a. If you want to see a little bit of Sturgis, we uh, edited a video together for our Willie video. Yes. And that is all Sturgis footage, too. So if you're dying to know what it's like at Sturgis, look up our Willie for a Day video, and then you'll find out. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, probably not something you'd have guessed even 10 or 15 years ago. That you'd be at Sturgis. No, no never. That's I'd never crazy. heard of it when our well, manager well, was like shooting that video in particular. Right? Yeah. No. Never. Yeah. It's Dressed good... as giant penises. And totally. Yep. Yep. Our manager was like, "What about Sturgis?" And Katie was like, "Yeah." And I was like, "Wait, what the fuck is Sturgis?" My family's from South Dakota, so like I knew exactly what uh-huh. we were getting into. It was great. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, well, so, I think that this the, the music is a clue good that they're outro. trying to get us yeah. out there. Yeah. So, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. So it's so good to see you. you. And last but by no means least, I spoke with Aaron Judge and Caitlin Bailey of The Cake Tour, which is currently making its way around the country using Kickstarter to fund each show. The Cake Tour used to be called the Pink Collar Comedy Tour, and I covered that a couple of years ago in The Globe. I've also known Aaron for years from her time in the Boston comedy scene and found her to be one of the smartest people I know in comedy. And it should be noted that this was Sunday night, late evening, and everyone was a little punch drunk after spending five days bouncing around from gig to gig in Boston, and I'm very bad at curbing silliness. So here are Aaron Judge and Caitlin Bailey on the last night of the festival outside the Rockwell Theater. I don't think I <laughs> couldn't imagine why I would be new for this. So I want you kicked off the cake tour. Are you recording? Yes, I'm recording yes. now. You kicked off the uh, the cake tour, was it uh, Thursday night? Friday, Friday night, night, night at Middlesex. Uh-huh. We had a sold out crowd mm-hmm. and we were standing, we room, were standing room only and we were worried about hitting capacity at the venue, which is pretty <laughs> exciting. They had to start, like, they were like, if anyone else walks in this room, we have to turn them away. Yeah, so it was a, a great, yeah, it was a great way to start mm-hmm. out the tour. Um, you know, we've been touring together for five years. Five years yeah, five mm-hmm. years now. But we just renamed our tour. Yes. And it's formerly, an acronym. Formerly the Pink Collar Comedy Tour. Now it's CAKE, which is an acronym for Carrie, Abby, Caitlin, and Erin. Yes. Mm-hmm. As and our, everyone loves cake. Mm-hmm. And yes. everyone loves cake. Everyone loves cake. Is that the reason for the name? I think it was the, the Carrie, acronym? Abby, Caitlin, Erin thing that we all fell in love with. Uh, uh-huh. And we also really felt like the other tour that we were doing was a learning tour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we really feel like now we know what we're about. We know what we do. We're I all... named the tour without anyone else and it took them four years to tell me they hated the name the whole time. And I respect that. I do. I respect <laughs> it. I do. And but but after four years of touring, I felt like I, you, it felt like you guys had like a sub meeting and then came to me and were like, we hate this thing. And I was like, I get it. And also when we started the tour, you made this point in the the article that you wrote that I thought was really awesome. Like, when we started the tour, the four of us were on again, off again, engaged in pink-collar jobs, you know, like Mm -hmm. waiting tables or secretarial work or other stuff. Neither of us, none of us was nurses, but, yeah, 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 other than that. Uh Um, And now, fast forward four years later, it feels like all of us, you know, like... Um, you know, Aaron and I are writers. And yeah. Like, you know, Carrie Abby has a TV touring. show. Yeah, Abby's the TV star. I mean, like, so it's so it's, it, it's no longer like our day job stories. Uh-huh. Right. Also, I apologize to future Nick because um, I can't tell the difference between my voice yes. and Caitlin's voice on a recording. <laughs> uh, We've done so, podcasts together, so just a heads up. I, I just don't, I don't know which one of us is talking when I listen to them. Well, Aaron Judge has been one of my comedic heroes since I met her at the Cape Fear Comedy Festival seven years yeah. ago. Uh, and and I feel like I so I've been copying her this whole time, and I think I <laughs> nailed it. You've just, just been doing I just nailed it. A yeah, very just, subtle Aaron Judge for, impression for, for several years. For seven years, yeah. Did just, you start it? <laughs> sort of, you know, add a couple of things, and then just like. Well, the, it's the reason that she we used to be like, together. "Hi, my name's Caitlin Bailey. <laughs> I'm from North Carolina. Can't you tell?" <laughs> Well, you'll have to do that again for every podcast now, so you can tell each other's voices. And I'll talk like this. I'm from Brooklyn. This uh-huh. is my normal way of I'll talking. I'll talk my southern accent, because I know it just works wonders with police officers and journalists, I'm sure. Uh-huh. It feels like I've been inter- interviewing two rich littles all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is an extremely hip reference. We've been drinking. For, for the kids, thing. for the kids, the rich little reference. Well, how long have you all known each other, I met Caitlin at Cape Caitlin. Fear yeah. seven Cape years Fear, ago. That was seven years. Okay. I knew Carrie around that same time, Abby mm-hmm. as well, when I was living in New York City, after I left Boston. Mm-hmm. 
so you'd known each other for a couple of years before you decided to tour. Mm-hmm. Was was it the the sort of pink collar job sort of thing that that made you? Was that the theme that drew, that let's, drew you together hey, to tour, or was it just I, sort of... I mean, like, I accosted you the first... Yes, yeah, Caitlin, the first festival we were at. Caitlin was like, I admire what you're doing, and I want to aspire to be like you. I feel like you were part of the conversation. And then I talked at her <laughs> and her husband while they were both on the beach for 90 uninterrupted minutes. That is a thing that I did to them. And then on two the years beach. later, yeah, Aaron we were... forgot how traumatic that experience was and agreed <laughs> to tour with me again. Caitlin decided to put together a one one-time tour, uh-huh. and she recruited three other female comedians to join her, which was her vision. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And then the four of us had so much fun working together that we decided to do it again. Mm-hmm. So this was yes. supposed to be a one-time event, yeah. Uh-huh. and instead it turned into now in its sixth year. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we've become like a band in a way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so yeah, we all have we all have our roles. I, like it started off as like my vision. I'm the George Harrison. This is Aaron Judge speaking. <laughs> yes. I don't know enough Beatle references, even after Aaron trying for five years. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you one uh, one time I, I I almost uh, tried to kill myself in the backseat of the car what? because Caitlin Bailey described Van Morrison as the lead singer of The Doors. Yes. But we've been touring together for so long that I requested the song about the girl with the skin, and Aaron knew immediately that I was talking about Ricky Martin's. Um, she, what, which song is it? Uh, La Vida Loca. Yeah. Yes, th- this is a very interesting musical. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That, you can't use any of this. We're wasting. I'm, I'm sorry. All of this is incomprehensible. This but, is the last night of the tour. Yes. I just did eight shows in five days. Uh-huh. I'm so tired. <laughs> What was the original question? <laughs> um, you, what's the name of your tour? <laughs> oh, I think I, I, think I just said, hello, how are you? I'm not even sure I asked the question We're yet. off on the races. Um, <laughs> stop talking. Do you have any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, do you feel like the, do you have a different theme now that it's cake, or are you just doing your your regular stand-up? I think, act? as the Boston Globe described us last time, we're still smart, funny I think what the Boston Globe said about us oh, yes, is yes. that it was smart comedy by female comics. Yes, that's and what I, uh, I think that it's also, um, it's all of our sets and all of our material that we do in other places. Mm-hmm. But when we all travel together, we interweave things. Yeah. We mm-hmm. make references to one another. We always mix up the lineup. We don't have a set lineup. Mm-hmm. And that's always based on how we feel, mm-hmm. on who has the biggest following in the city that we're in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's so much fun to just all share the spotlight and all have equal weight because there's no um there's like the the gumption of going first and like the glory of going last and we sh- we all share, share all of that. that there's no hierarchy mm-hmm. between the four of us which is great yeah and you've got an interesting method of touring i've heard as far as doing kickstarters for different cities this tour which was the first cake mm-hmm. tour we decided to sell tickets in advance via kickstarter in mm-hmm. cities and attempt to fund a kickstarter campaign of getting up to a thousand dollars in ticket sales mm-hmm. and was, ticket is our sales, minimum between the four of us it's that that's the point that we don't lose money mm-hmm. and ticket sales um plus you know whatever it's the kickstarter model so if a fan is in a city and like i really want to bring them they can bring they can donate eighty dollars mm-hmm. um and yep. or buy an eighty dollar ticket but exactly. also people can just pre-buy tickets and mm-hmm. that way we can decide if like okay well is you know Pittsburgh really into us and when we do fund mm-hmm. a city it's like okay well we have a commitment of people who are going to come right we have fans in the city who want it to happen and um, I think Kickstarter has been really fun in helping us come up with this model but we also learned a lot yeah mm-hmm. and so the- as we move forward with Kickstarter like I think we'll do things Maybe a little bit differently, when but it's the, been a great experience. When the Pink Collar Comedy Tour started, we started as a Kickstarter success story. Mm. Uh, so we we started. I forgot if it was like three or six thousand dollars, but we got our no, initial. No, we raised five hundred dollars and then toured for five years on it. No, it was definitely more. It was like I think it was like three thousand dollars. I don't know about that. All right. Well, we can fact check that we'll later. Look it it's up. literally on yeah. the internet. Uh, but anyway, so we when we started Kickstarter, we started as a Kickstarter success story, and we toured for five years on that. Mm-hmm. And then at the Brooklyn Comedy Festival, I uh, got drunk at the after party that was happening at Kickstarter and whined at uh, <laughs> Taylor, who is like the head of comedy at Kickstarter. That I after touring for five years with the Pink Color Comedy which was an initial Kickstarter success story, it was really frustrating to like absolutely crush it in like 80, 90% of cities mm-hmm. and then just 
lose money, lose money and for cities. dumb yeah. reasons in other cities. Or we'd have like a producer that was lying to like us or themselves about like what they could do, or we just wouldn't connect with the town or whatever. And it, it you know, as a DIY self-funded tour, our margins are fairly small. Like mm -hmm. every band that you've never heard of, or I'm Even not a good many metric. bands that you have heard of, but yes. bands yeah. that Caitlin hasn't heard of. I haven't heard, any of, I haven't heard any of the bands. Well, I've I mean, interviewed bands frequently that, that yes. might be playing 900-seat venues, and they're saying, you know, they're still, they're still kind of, you know, they're still kind of working mm -hmm. for a living, and, and, and they're yeah. still kind of, they, they, exactly. they, they're not... So you have one huge stars the right. way you might think they are. Right. You have you, one city that's a loss on an otherwise successful 10, 12 city tour. You're still looking at a tour that is breaking even instead of making money. Making mm -hmm. money. So we wanted to solve for that problem. And I whined at Taylor about it. And he said, I think that we could solve that problem. And four meetings later, this is the model we came up with, mm -hmm. where we would do focused, geographic specific, uh, pre ticketing pre-sale ticketing through mm -hmm. Kickstarter with the deal of like if we make enough money then we'll come to your town and if we don't we won't and so you can make a donation of mm -hmm. $500 if you're really committed to us coming to Pittsburgh or you can buy a you know a, a $10 student artist a $10 ticket. artist ticket mm -hmm. or student ticket or you can buy four $25 tickets or you can buy a ticket a t-shirt like there are a lot of different ways to get there mm -hmm. but we're not coming if we're gonna probably lose money. Mm -hmm. And that was the deal that we made with our fans and Kickstarter, and it worked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was it was really cool to see it all work. And I think that the, the lessons that we learned are that we need to figure out how to space it all out because mm -hmm. you need like, you know, 15 to 30 stressful. days to get a Kickstarter campaign going. So if you're right. doing a single tour, you run up against the, the actual start it becomes, of your tour. It becomes mm -hmm. more challenging to book venues yeah, if it's like the sixth Kickstarter campaign, because you don't want to book a venue until you've cleared your goal. cleared your goal. Right. But if you're not clearing your goal, until then the, all the great venues are getting eaten up. So it's like right. you know, it becomes a it's a logistics problem, but it's a solvable logistics problem. And is this a model you might keep doing, or is this sort yeah, of training I mean, wheels until you get to these cities and yeah, I you think can make inroads. I think that it's similar to I've seen a lot of musicians do this model where they're like, I want to make an album. <laughs> If I yeah. hit my goal, I'll make an album, and your the main prize is the album, right? right? Like the main reward is the album, and my mega fans can get a T-shirt or whatever sure. as well. But most people are just kind of pre-buying an album in order mm -hmm. to get it made. This mm -hmm. is just pre-buying tickets in order to get the tour coming, <laughs> right? You know, and Same. so it's yeah. it's a similar thing. I think once people click on that, once people register that that's what's happening, mm -hmm. they'll um, they'll participate more. And but it's 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 interesting because I look at like my spending on Kickstarter and mm -hmm. I love to give like 25 bucks as mm -hmm. like you know that's like sort of like oh my friend's making a comic book here's 25 sure. bucks like right. but then a lot of people are like oh 25 bucks for a ticket who am I like I don't know I need to get I need to talk to my friends and that's two months away mm -hmm. you know it's like committing to the actual event is like right. a little bit of a of a stumbling block I think for some people rather than just getting something whenever it's done right exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly and so and so they're a little bit more like oh I don't know but it's like no it's similar like mm -hmm. you can make it and if if you can't make it you can give your tickets away yeah. and like it'll all be a wash it'll be <laughs> good so yeah mm -hmm. And just to wrap up about the Women in Comedy Festival itself, you, you've been doing them since the first one, correct? Have yes, you been? I've been at every single one. Uh, well, what did you think of this year's, the Unreal. scope of this year's festival? Unreal. It was so much bigger, so much more professional. There were so many more headlining comedians, so many comedians that I myself was excited to see mm -hmm. Yeah. that I just was, like, floored. I couldn't keep up with it. There were so many people here who were just, I mean above a level that I consider to be super professional, mm -hmm. like at least 20 people, you know? And mm -hmm. so it was it was so exciting to be a part of, and the 78 shows, and I was honestly so impressed and excited to see the turnout. Mm -hmm. Boston came yeah, out for these shows. The shows like, packed. I had a 10 p.m. show here at the Davis Square Theater that was like, you know, a fantastic lineup, but there was no big name headliner on mm -hmm. it, and it was packed. And I just, I just really find it so amazing how much this festival has grown and I think that this was a year where the comedians who made an effort to get here really were rewarded for it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's sort of like, I mean, 
it, yeah, the Women in Comedy Festival has been inspiring. You know, I, I'm so glad that I was able to be here for like the whole time. And it's kind of the the thing that we're kind of doing with Cake uh, and have been doing since the Pink Collar Comedy Tour. Mm -hmm. You know, like pairing with like local women centric charities. Like, if you want to see more women in comedy, support women in comedy. And Boston mm -hmm. has clearly done that. And I hope that we can do that. Uh, all over the country. Was this the first uh, Women in Comedy Festival you've done? Yeah, this is well? my this is my first one. Mm. Yeah. Did you other than Cake? Did you see anybody you'd want to tell anybody to go look up? I mean, to I've go, been a fan. They of, need to see. I've been a fan of the Reformed Whores since we worked with them in Charleston, and I mean, I love Aparna and Joe Firestone is mm. so fucking funny. And who was that woman that we saw that first night? Oh God! Why are you doing this to me? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, remember where we were like, stay and watch so and so. I, oh, Nicole Byer. Yes. Oh yeah, she was great. She's amazing. Yeah, she's I amazing. Saw, I, I discovered a few people I'd never seen before as well. The Femity Trio were, were mm -hmm. fantastic. Caitlin Gill I'd never seen. Oh, she's Caitlin amazing. <laughs> she worked with us in San Francisco. And uh, Reform Tours <laughs> I'd actually seen before. I uh, they've been on. The, they were on the podcast last year. Uh, I I talked to them before the. Uh, well, they opened up for Dweezil Zappa here. Mm -hmm. So they're the, my first repeat guests because I got to talk to them a little bit and see what they were doing. They're, so it's been a great, I love what they do. It's, it's, it's great. It's been a great festival for finding mm -hmm. people I've never heard of before that resonate sort of immediately. And, like, I think that the people who came out and became fans of comedy are already loyal. Like, I can see it in yeah. my Twitter followers. I can see it in that there were people who were like sending me messages saying I saw you on the first night and I wanted to see your fourth night show mm -hmm. but there were no more tickets left like they wanted to come back you know and so that's like a really amazing inroad for women to have all these new fans in Boston yes and where should people look for information on you individually and for cake cakecomedy.com mm -hmm. um, for me you can look at erinjudge.com that's e-r-i-n-j-u-d-g-e mm -hmm. Because your parents pulled your name normal. I'm a uh, I'm Caitlin <laughs> Caitlin Bailey dot com. It's it's they, it's weird. It's K A Y T L I N Bailey B A I L E Y, and it's just at Caitlin Bailey spelled my weird way on Twitter. And Twitter's mm -hmm. my favorite. But uh, Abby has promised that she's teaching me how to learn Instagram this tour. So I'm looking forward to uh, I have a figuring that out. And it doesn't play well with Instagram oh. if I'm that that person who <laughs> can't leave the BlackBerry. Which Are is you, neither here nor there. They, but I'll we'll end before I tangent on the blackberry. No, but I do want to hear this after. But you know, you, yeah, guys, we All gotta right, go. We gotta end a blackberry story. Yeah. All right, yeah, we, I won't subject you to this. But, <laughs> bye. An arrow to the head isn't always a trick. And that was the Women in Comedy Festival edition of the Department of Tangents podcast. Please check out the festival at wicf.com and check out the Femity Trio. Caitlin Gill, Reformed Whores, and the Comedians of Cape Comedy Tour at their respective websites and on Twitter. And to play us out, this is Trainwrecker from Scott H. Byram's latest album, The Bad Testament. It's a great gritty track, and if you like it, you can find the new album and tour dates and more at scottbyram.com. S-C-O-T-T-B-I-R-A-M.com. And if you like this podcast, you can subscribe on iTunes and Stitcher and wherever quality podcasts are downloaded. Thank you, and now, train wrecker. Out on the highway, the rain came pouring down. I saw him put my baby six feet in the ground. I called my mama on the telephone that night. I said, Mama, I just gotta win this fight. She said, You better leave that ring in Tennessee. Get back and take this boy right where you're supposed to be You can't win them all, my son, and this time it's a shame You know that's how you got your middle name I saw the flame burning deep into the night I saw the blood where I used to see the light I promised mama I was gonna lay it down But just like all this bad weather Here come the train wrecker Just turn
good wine. I saw the demon rising up and out the ground. We began to sin together. Train wrecker, train wrecker, train wrecker, train wrecker, yeah, yeah. You wish you never put your head into the wind. You wish you had a better hold on all this sin. You can't believe you're gonna end up in the ground. I know you want to lay it down. Trouble call for trouble when the devil gets his way. You just can't live a life so free. It's a matter of fact that your life will pull away when you're standing where the river meets the sea. I saw the flame burning deep into the night. I saw the blood where I used to see the light. I promised my mom I was gonna lay down. But just like all this bad weather, I am the motherfucking train wrecker. Train wrecker! Train wrecker, yeah! Train wrecker! Wow! Dear Young.